Um, we have been in this series called Grassroots, and I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed it, given it was my brainchild, so I probably enjoyed it a little bit more than most, but I've really enjoyed it because during, um, during the COVID shutdown, I feel like it gave everyone this opportunity to kind of pare back, to peel back our busy lives. You know, prior to it, I, I couldn't tell you what I'd be doing two or three days in a row. I was so busy. And we were just going from one thing to another and one thing to another, and we were barely at home, and, and we were struggling with just constant busyness. And then when everything hit and they shut us down, it was like this moment. At first, it was terrifying, and then it was like this moment where Lee and I looked at each other and said, wow, we have time to actually evaluate our lives and to say, are we, are we doing what what we should be doing right now. And for the church, what that meant for us is to look and just take a very real look at the church and say, okay, are we doing ministry the way that we should be doing ministry? Are we, you know, doing the mission that God gave us to the way that we are supposed to be? And so this has given us that chance to really just take everything that builds up in life, because that happens, right? Life just builds up and you don't even necessarily expect it to, it just does. And to kind of rip it down to the bare essentials. And so for months, we were kind of transformed into our home churches, you know, without our uh, really wanting to be, but we were transformed into having home churches. And, uh, and then now we're able to be back together, but it's still different, you know? And so it gives us that chance to really kind of um, just look at our, ourselves and analyze. And so that's where Grassroots was kind of born from. It was born from this desire to, to go back to the early church and say, Lord, how did, you, how did you lay it out? You know, have we deviated from what you want us to, to be on? Have we deviated from the path that you gave us? And if we haven't, great. Yay us. But if we have, how do we get back to that spot? How do we move back to being able to go down that path that God is really calling us to go down to? And so the very first week, um, I talked about how in the ministry of Jesus, you had the disciples and they walked with God, but they didn't really understand the mission. You know, they were, they were walking with him, but they had this whole idea of what they were doing. They thought that they were going to be building up this earthly kingdom and ruling with Jesus. And so they had this, this completely different path and how in our lives, God can detour us. God can you know, we can be going this way, and that's what COVID kind of did to all of us, is we were going in one path, and God, and this detour came, and it said, okay, it gives us a chance to kind of make decisions and, and see what is the path that maybe God wants us to go to. And then the second week, Lee talked about how the foundation of the church is unity, and how um, it is our job to be unified. We accomplish unity within the church through compassion for one another, um, through compassion for the lost, through seeking to help the lost, um, and also through being truthful to the gospel of Jesus. And then on the third week, he discussed how serious God was about sin and righteousness. And he talked about a story that honestly, most pastors kind of breeze right through, Ananias and Sapphira. You know, they, they read it and then they're like, well, we'll skip that. And so we talked about that story and how it shows us that God is really serious about righteousness and really serious about the sin issues in our life and how if we want to follow the example of the early church. We have to be serious about sin and righteousness. We can't just be apathetic about it or, or let it pass us by. So this topic of uh, this uh, week, Lee and I went back and forth and argued about who was going to take it because we both wanted it, um, but I won. And so um, we are going to be talking about a topic that a lot of churches uh, don't talk about. And however, it's a topic that if omitted, causes a really big gap in knowing God, in knowing the God that we serve. So most people know that you have the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But a lot of churches and people, they kind of say it like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You know, and it's like the, it's the part of God, the part of the Trinity that is kind of pushed to the side. Lee likes to refer to it as people like to treat the Holy Spirit like the crazy uncle that we know is part of the family, but we kind of put in the corner and hope doesn't embarrass us and, and hope just kind of stays there and keeps his mouth shut and doesn't say too much. And that's what a lot of churches 
how they respond to the Holy Spirit. And then maybe it's the way that people are raised. I mean, I was raised in a Pentecostal church, so the Holy Spirit was a part of every single service. But a lot of times in my raising, it was also abused and it was also misused. And so when several times in my life, I've had kind of a bad taste in my mouth about the topic because of, of I've seen humans take a portion of God and, and not really treat it with the reverence that it needs to be treated with. Um, and maybe you were raised in a church that was cessationist, which means that they believe that the Holy Spirit died um, with the apostles. And maybe you were raised in a church that just didn't talk about it, that they, you know, you, you're, you know, kind of indifference to it is not necessarily a doctrinal thing, but it's just a lack of knowledge. So we all come from these different paths, and we all have had exposure to the Holy Spirit in different manners. And likewise with the Father and the Son, but for some reason, and I don't know if it's because we can read stories about God and stories about Jesus, and there's not as much about the Holy Spirit, but for some reason the Holy Spirit tends to be the one that people either omit or they obsess about or they just kind of not, just not know how to handle. And so today we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, because I believe to fully understand the God that we serve, we have to understand all of God. We can't pick and choose the persons of God to know about and to learn about any more than we can pick and choose what's in the Bible. If I take the Bible and I say, well, I really like Luke, but I'm a little iffy about Acts, and I, and I really don't like the Old Testament because that scares me. So I'm going to just focus on these. I'm perverting the Bible and I'm perverting the Word of God because I'm not looking at it in its entirety. I'm not accepting the parts that scare me or the parts that confuse me or the parts that maybe I don't understand and I need to study more. I'm just looking at what I like. And that's an issue. And so I look at the Trinity in the same way. If we look at the Trinity and we say, well, the Father I can relate to, you know, the son is great. He gave his life for me. I love Jesus. But the Holy Spirit just, just I don't understand it or I, it scares me. And so I'm just going to leave it to the side. Then we really are not understanding fully the God that we serve. And so today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. Because a lot of people base the Holy Spirit off their own experiences. But let's look at what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, what the function is in our life, what he's meant for, what he was given to us for. But before we get into that, like always, we're going to start with prayer. So please bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord, I just, uh, I thank you so much that we are able to be together again. I thank you so much that I'm able to stand up in front of people and we're able to gather and just see everyone's smiling faces and just grow stronger in you, God. I just thank you um, that that you have kept us healthy, that you have blessed us. I just pray that you would be with us today, that our, our hearts would be open, that our ears would be open, that we would accept and receive this part of who you are into our lives in a more, in a deeper, just more intimate way, God. I pray that you would just reveal your person to us through these words, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we read Acts, the very first thing that you see is that Jesus put the Holy Spirit in a very high importance. After he appears to the disciples alive, following his death on the cross, he gives them some orders and he says to them, okay, go to Jerusalem and, and wait. Wait for me because I'm going to give something to you that's, it's a big deal. I'm going to give something to you and you need this. And so go to there and don't do the mission that I've called you to until you receive it. So go and wait. In Acts 1.6, we see the disciples still did not fully understand what the mission was. So Jesus has been telling them for three years what's going to happen. He dies on the cross. He gets raised from the dead. And the disciples still, after all that, they say, Lord, is this the time you're going to restore your kingdom and we're going to rule with you on earth? And Jesus is like, Ugh. Like, no, you know, and he's still constantly trying to get them to understand this, but they're still, after everything, not understanding. They were in this mindset that Jesus was there to restore an earthly kingdom, and Jesus was trying to give them the Holy Spirit, and they just weren't getting it. But in Acts 1, we see the very first action of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given to the disciples and to us as a source of power to witness for Jesus Christ. 
in Acts 1, 7 through 8, if you have your Bibles um, with you, turn to Acts 1, 7 through 8. Jesus says, he said to them, it is not for you to know times and things which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and even to the road, remotest parts of the earth. So the disciples are asking, is this the time? And he's saying, it's not your place. It's not your place to know when I'm going to set up my kingdom on earth. It's not your place to know what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it. What you have to do, what your place is, is to receive the Holy Spirit and go tell people about me. That's your role. You're not, you're not going to know when all these injustices are going to be made right. You may not know exactly the full plan, but your job is to receive the Holy Spirit and use that spirit to lead the world to me. And I'm sure that they weren't thrilled about this answer because you have to realize at this time, the disciples didn't have Paul's letters to know that the church was going to flourish and that people were going to come to know God. They didn't have the New Testament to know the end of the story. We read the Bible and we have all that. We have that whole story to be able to understand the progression of things. They didn't have that. They were in a place of complete confusion that they, they Jesus is back and now he's leaving again. And they don't know what's going to happen. And all they know is that they have to wait for this Holy Spirit, who they do not know. They don't know what's going to happen, what he's going to bring, what he's going to do. But instead of ignoring it or saying, you know, that's too scary for me, they just obeyed. They trusted Jesus and they went. And so they see Jesus ascend to heaven and they go and they wait in the upper room. And what I love about this is they don't wait apathetically. How many times in our lives have we, has God said, you need to wait, it's not time, you need to wait. And we, and we grumble and we complain and we're like, when is this over? You know, I just want it to happen. The disciples didn't wait apathetically. It says that they devoted themselves to prayer, growing together in the faith. So they spent that time, they knew they had a big job coming. They knew that God had commissioned them to something huge and it was going to be a big deal. And so they decided to gather together and just wait on the Lord and pray and devote themselves to God until it happened. However long that was going to be, they were going to wait and listen to Jesus. And then it happens. And in this, it's, the Bible says suddenly. So out of nowhere, this violent rushing wind noise comes in and tongues of fire which they've never seen this before. This would be, we have the Bible to say, okay, I can kind of imagine what that would be like. They had no frame of reference. And tongues of fire comes through the entire room and starts to settle on each of them. And they start speaking in other languages. Craziness. I mean, this, this had to have been just the most amazing thing that you could ever imagine. And it's so loud that people outside are hearing it and they're starting to gather because that would be what we would all do, right? If that happened, if all these people that we saw started speaking in other languages and people were gathering and because they weren't used to seeing the supernatural, they weren't used to, to seeing this and they had no frame of reference, the only natural thing that they could think of is happening is that all of these people are just massively drunk. And so they start to mock them and they say, oh, look at them, they're, they're just all drunk, you know? And, and then in Acts 2.14, it says, but Peter taking his stand with the 11. And I'm going to stop there because this is significant. Up until this point, the disciples had done everything under the power of Jesus, under his ministry. There were many times, if you read the Gospels, that what Jesus was doing, the disciples didn't even have confidence that he could do it. You know, when, when he says, I'm going to feed all these people with these loaves and fishes, and they're like, you know there's only this much, right? You know, like he didn't know how many fishes and loaves there were. But they didn't have that confidence. But they did everything under the power of Jesus' ministry. And Peter, just a little while before, he was given the opportunity to profess Jesus Christ, and he ran. He denied Christ three times, and he ran. So up until this point, they hadn't given a lot of strength to in their witness. They really hadn't been tested. And when they were tested, they didn't really follow through with it. But yet now... Filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter and every one of the disciples take a stand against the mockers. They raise their voices. They, they declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he did the miracles he said he was going to do, that he died on the cross, he was risen again, he ascended into heaven, and that he was there for them to receive salvation and receive the Holy Spirit. 
And they do all of this with confidence. That is the Holy Spirit in action. People that before couldn't answer a little girl when he says, do you know Jesus Christ? And all of a sudden stand up in front of 3,000 people filled with the Holy Spirit and say, this is my God and this is who he is. And, and you need to know, and I need to tell you, that's the Holy Spirit in action. In Acts 2, 30, 37, the Bible says, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 41, it says, so then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day they added 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to breaking of bread and to prayer. That's the Holy Spirit in action. That is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit takes a man like Peter who is denying Christ and gives him the power to stand up in front of thousands and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and 3,000 people come to know him. The Holy Spirit takes the words of man and pierces the heart. It says in the scripture that it pierced their hearts. It turns the denier of Christ into the defender and minister of God. It turns a mocker into a member of of the body of Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It empowers the natural human to do supernatural things. And maybe that looks like speaking in tongues. Maybe that looks like praying over somebody and seeing a healing take place. Maybe that looks like having the strength to tell your coworker about Christ. Maybe that looks like standing up in front of people and telling them about God. However that looks in your life, it's that empowerment to be able to do what you know that God is calling you to do that you could not do in your own abilities, that you would not do in your own abilities. The Spirit of God empowers us to move beyond our natural nature and walk into the realm of God's supernatural nature. Peter couldn't have done this on his own he had his chance at the death of Christ and he failed to follow through. He needed the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to be able to do these things. So the first action and purpose of the Holy Spirit is to empower us to do the ministry that Jesus calls us to do. God gave us, Jesus gave us the mission. The Spirit empowers us and mobilizes us to do that mission. The second purpose or action of the Holy Spirit is to help us view the world through the realm of spiritual good and evil and not earthly good and evil. Most people define this as the Spirit as our comforter, but I really think it goes deeper than that. In John 14, 16 through 17, Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he, develop, he dwells within you and will be in you. The word helper in this scripture comes from the Greek word parakletos, which means advocate, counselor, comforter. It is saying that the Holy Spirit is a comforter and it assists us. And I like that the scripture says that, that Jesus is gonna send another helper, because what it alludes to is that the Holy Spirit is to us what Jesus was to the disciples. Jesus walked alongside the disciples. He led them. He talked them through things they didn't understand. He comforted them when they were angry. He admonished them when they made mistakes. He was gentle. He was a comforter. He guided them through all of this, this new stuff that he was presenting to them. And this scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit is to us what Jesus was to the disciples, that he guides us, he convicts us when we're going down a path that he knows full well we're not supposed to be going down. But he allows us to see good and evil in a spirit realm instead of a natural one. I think this is a really important role of the spirit that a lot of times gets overlooked. We live in this natural world, we can touch it, we can feel it, we can see it, we can hear it, but we battle in a supernatural world. The good and evil that we battle from, we can't always see, we can't always hear. When we pray, we are pushing back powers of darkness. We're breaking off things that we may not ever be able to see. But that's what we're battling. We always say that there's power in prayer, and I think sometimes people say that, and they, 
they don't really understand what they're saying. You know, they say there's power in prayer, but there really is, guys. There's power in prayer. There are things that happen in the spirit realm that when we pray in the physical realm, it happens that we will never understand and we will never see. In Galatians 5, 22 to 23, we read the fruit of the spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These things aren't just things we strive for. These things are the fruit of a life lived in the spirit of God. They are the product of the Spirit thriving and active in us every day. We can try to do these things on our natural level. We can try to be better. We can try to be kinder. But the truth is, is we will always fail in that without the Holy Spirit. Our nature will take over. When we live understanding that every person around us is fighting their own battle, they're fighting their own personal spiritual battle, but that God loves them deeply. Every person you meet, on the side of the road, every person you meet in mire, they are battling something and God loves them deeply. So when that person betrays you or says something mean to you or, or is absolutely cruel to you, the Holy Spirit allows us to see beyond that human that is hurting us and understand that that's a person that has a soul that's hurting and that God loves that person and that we have to pray for that person. We have to care for that person, that we have to acknowledge that that person is just as loved by God as we are, no matter what they do, that they're just as loved by God as what we are. And that's what the Holy Spirit allows us to do, not take revenge like our nature wants us to, not get angry like our nature wants us to, but to look past that and respond in a spiritual or supernatural way of saying, you know what, I am hurt, and I'm going to have to rely on the Holy Spirit to comfort that hurt in me. But I know that that person is hurting because they need Jesus. And they're hurting because they have a void in their life that they need filled. And maybe I can help them with that. Maybe instead of being revengeful, maybe instead of being hateful, maybe instead of being angry and and do something that's going to not reflect Christ, maybe my role is what the disciples' role was to just receive the Holy Spirit and tell people about God. Maybe I don't need to know the whole story. Maybe I don't need to make everything perfect. Maybe my role is to hear and receive the Holy Spirit and then tell people about Jesus. See, the world we live in is not at peace. It's never really been at peace, right? We think that it's worse now, but you read the Bible, it's never really been at peace. We can see that from turning on the news for two minutes. Our natural world is not at peace, but the church must be. We as followers of Jesus must be a source of peace. If we're not, we need to evaluate what we are being guided from? Are we being guided from the spirit of God? Are we being guided from the spirit of the flesh? Are we a source of peace for the world? Are we, are we a source of peace? Do people see us and say, you know what? I don't, maybe I don't know what's different about them. Maybe I don't even know Jesus. So I don't know how to identify that what's different is Jesus Christ, but I just know that there's a peace there that I need. I know that there's a peace there that I'm drawn to. When I think of the person who showed us a beautiful example of walking in the spirit, I think of Stephen, the first martyr. And his story is pretty short, so a lot of people, they they know that he may be the first martyr, but they don't know a lot about him. In Acts 6, 8, we read the story of Stephen. Stephen was one of the seven chosen to lead and be given tasks so that the disciples could devote themselves to prayer and the study of the word and the ministry that they were called to. And the first thing it says about Stephen, and it says this three or four times, which is significant because it's rarely that the Bible points this out that many times about a person. But the first thing that it says about Stephen is that he is a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. The next thing is that he's full of grace and power, and he was performing great wonders and signs among the people. I'm going to read a little bit of the the first passage. So if you have your Bibles, and it's it's in Acts 6, 8. And it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Syrians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Isn't that amazing? Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. 
They put forward false witnesses who said this man incessantly speaks against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say to this Nazarene Jesus, we'll destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Now I'm going to stop here for a second because honestly this first part tells us everything we need to know about Stephen. He was operating fully in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says it three times just in that first little passage. I didn't read the whole thing, but in that first passage it says it three times that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So he was a man who was operating with grace, faithfulness. He was performing miracles through the Holy Spirit. He was wise in his words. And all of these people who were religious leaders and very well trained, they could not cope with the spirit of the wisdom that he was speaking. After this, in chapter 7, Stephen speaks to the high priest and he stands up to them and he calls out the hypocrisy of what they were doing. And he proclaims Jesus and he calls them out for resisting the Holy Spirit. How many times have our, in our lives have we resisted the Holy Spirit? When he's trying to guide us, when he's trying to, to tell us, no, that's not where you're supposed to be, or, hey, you know, temper the anger down and be kind and gracious, and we resist that. That's what these religious leaders, he called them out for that, for resisting the Holy Spirit, for not allowing themselves to walk in the Spirit, but instead stick to their religion and deny Christ. Now, you can imagine that this was going to make them angry. Stephen knew this was going to make him angry. He knew what he was doing. He wasn't he wasn't unwise. He knew exactly what he was doing. But he had the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and he knew that he needed to do it. And when he's done speaking, the Bible says that they were cut to the quick, and they were angry. And then in verse 55, it says, But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. When opposition came, when Stephen was threatened with his life, argued with, not mocked, instead of looking at the physical around him, instead of looking at the injustice that was happening to him, the violence that, was, that he knew was coming, that he knew his life was, was going to be threatened, he looked up and he focused on the supernatural spiritual things in his life. And he sees God and Jesus standing next to him. And he's able to focus on what's important and walk in the spirit at the most absolute challenging time in his life. Now, the reality is that Stephen died that day. They dragged him out and they stoned him in that moment. In their anger and their resistance to the Holy Spirit and their anger at what he was saying. Their nature could not handle it. And so they ended up killing him and creating the first martyr for Christ. But even at his death, it's amazing because it says that Stephen looked up and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, do not hold the sin against them. Even in the moment of his death, by the hands of his persecutors, his love for people, his forgiveness, his kindness, his compassion for his murderers was evident. That is the Holy Spirit in action. That is somebody who can look and say, you know what, the this, this spiritual thing's happening to me right now, I can understand them and I can see them and this is bigger than me. And yes, this is awful, but I'm going to keep looking at Jesus and I'm going to keep focusing on that. That's the Holy Spirit in action. Opposition will always come when we're walking in the way of the Holy Spirit because the enemy doesn't want you to have it. You guys might be sitting there and maybe you aren't as confident Maybe the Holy Spirit scares you, intimidates you. You don't feel good enough to go out and tell people about Jesus or all of the myriad of feelings that we go through on a daily basis. But I can tell you that the enemy knows that with the Holy Spirit thriving in you, that you are a force that cannot be, that he can't contend with. You're a force that can't be stopped. And you might not understand that, but he does. He knows full well that coupled with the knowledge and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, understanding the Trinity and serving God, knowing the word of God, being in prayer and devoted to prayer, that you are a force that the devil cannot touch. And he knows that. So he will always come in with opposition. 
The minute that you start to say, I'm going to understand God more, I'm going to start to follow God, he will bring opposition into your life every time because the spirit of God will always be in opposition to the spirit of the flesh. The spirit of the flesh is what we fight against. In our lives every day, we have the choice to live and walk in the spirit of God or in the spirit of flesh. And every day we make those choices. They're little tiny choices, you know, or they're big ones. Stevens was a big one. But sometimes for us, it's the little tiny choices every day where we say, okay, you know, God, somebody just said something or did something unkind to me. And we say, you know, I'm just, I'm going to stop and I'm going to respond with kindness. That's walking in the spirit. That's, that's following the spirit of God instead of the spirit of the flesh. The spirit of God says to walk in love, kindness, patience. The spirit of the flesh says to walk in fear, bitterness, and unforgiveness. And so every day we get to choose what we are going to walk in. I could probably talk for another week about this topic. I won't, but I could probably talk for another week about this because you can't, you can't scratch the surface of the Holy Spirit in a 45 minute sermon. It's a third of the God that we serve. We spend our whole lives learning about who God is. And a lot of times we don't take that time to really learn what the Holy Spirit is. And that is a third of the Trinity of the God that we serve. The most important thing to know out of everything that I've said is to remember that on a daily basis, you have a God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, that deeply loves you, that's rooting for you, that's guiding you, that cares about every decision you make and wants to see you grow. A person who walks in the spirit reflects kindness and love, ministers passionately to others, stands up and speaks about God and seeks daily to get to know the aspects of God more deeply. That is what we strive to go for. That's what we strive for in our life. In our day, that is what we have to focus on. And I, I hope, I pray that as we go forward, that we become even more a church that seeks to learn what the Holy Spirit is for us, that seeks to learn how the Holy Spirit interacts in our life and how we can seek to be better at understanding the Holy Spirit and walking in the Spirit on a daily basis. So I'm going to close in prayer if you'll bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, I just, I thank you so much that you, that you give us so much of who you are, that you pour out in all of us, all of yourself, and that we have the opportunity, if we so choose, we have the opportunity to receive your Spirit to allow you to guide us, to counsel us, to empower us, to be able to be who you called us to be, God, to be able to do the things that you call us to do, that when we are faced with something that you are telling us to do and we don't feel adequate for it, when we're scared of it, when we don't feel good enough, that you give us your Holy Spirit to empower us, to show us that we can do this, not on our own, but that through you, all things are possible. That we are just human, but through you, we are strong, powerful lovers of God who are going to change this world. And I just pray that you would just encourage all of us to seek all of you, to seek all of the Trinity, to look at all of the areas of your personality, of who you are, even if they're not already known to us, even if they scare us, but to seek that out on a daily basis and just deepen our knowledge of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. If you have an interest in learning more about the Holy Spirit, I just want to encourage you, see Lee and I, we don't, we're not going to have every Sunday talking about deep study of the Holy Spirit, but there are books, there are things that we can share that can really help you understand and deepen your knowledge of this topic. And so I just pray that you guys will do that. And if you have an interest in that, ask us and we can help you with that. So have a wonderful day, guys. We love you.